Thank you very much for this invitation and the opportunity uh, to speak here. <coughs> this is one of the uh, uh, from Plato to NATO lectures, in this case from Cain to, uh, to ISIS. Uh, so what I, should, what I should be talking about today is both the earliest and most recent stages in the history of war and the fundamental question that each raises with respect to the phenomenon of war, why it occurs, and where, is it, where it is heading. We begin with the question of since when humans fight? Has warfare always been with us? Is as old as our species? Our species is about 150,000 years old. Or is it a relatively new phenomenon, only emerging with humankind's cultural evolution? For instance, with the advent of agriculture that occurs in the most pioneering groups of people some 10,000 years ago. Or the emergence of the state, again from some, from some 5,000 years ago onward. It was in the field of political philosophy that the question of the genesis of human fighting was first addressed systematically. Here the two conflicting answers were formulated by Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century and by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th. For Hobbes, the pre-state condition was characterized by a war of all against all, when in the absence of a peace enforcing authority, life was, I quote, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. For Rousseau, things were quite the opposite. The aboriginal condition of humans was fundamentally peaceful and innocent. In the absence of property before agriculture, there was little to fight about. War, according to Rousseau, is a late development, one of the ills of civilization. So convincing were each of these two positions that they have remained with us until today. But who was right, Hobbes or Rousseau? What light can archaeology, for example, shed on our question? Unfortunately, not that much. And the main reason for this is that weapons for fighting before the introductions of me introduction of metals are practically indistinguishable from hunting implements. Stone axes, spears, and arrows. Were they used for hunting only, or were they dual purpose and used also for fighting? As to specialized fighting equipment, <coughs> such as shields, it is made of perishable material, wood and leather, and, and does not survive. Also, people did not live in sedentary dwellings, and therefore evidence of fortification and destruction by fire that we find in later periods does not exist. The same applies to the evidence from cemeteries, which also appear only when people settle down in sedentary settlements. The discipline that is the richest in relevant information for answering this question is anthropology, which studies extant and recently extinct pre-state and pre-agricultural societies. Not that access to and the, inter and, the and the interpretation of that information are easy. The main problem is the so-called contact paradox. These societies have no written records of their own, and documentation therefore requires contact with literate societies that necessarily affect the former. As in quantum mechanics, the very activity of observation changes the object under observation. Literate societies of goods, such as agricultural products, livestock, and manufactured tools, which hunter-gatherers might want to steal, for example. How can it be determined that their warlike behavior on their part did not originate only with contact and had not existed before. How can one observe pure hunter-gatherer societies that are free from contact with agriculturalists and states? This is like the light in the refrigerator. In the refrigerator, does it really turn off when the door closes? A friend told me that uh, she was able to resolve the mystery. Her brother once locked her in the refrigerator, <laughs> and it was dark. 
The challenge then is how to observe pure hunter-gatherer societies to determine whether they fought or not. And the most significant te test, test case in this regard, surprise, is Australia. An entire continent of Aboriginal hunter-gatherers with no agriculturalists and pastoralists at all, whose in isolation came to an end only 200 years ago, a little more, in 1788, when you guys came here. <laughs> this is the closest to a pure laboratory on the continental scale that we are ever going to get incorporating about 300 uh, regional groups or tribes when the Europeans arrived. The evidence shows that the Aboriginals frequently fought, fought among themselves, including the material evidence of shields, which were not, of course, used for hunting kangaroos. Much the same applies to the vast mi microcosms of hunter-gatherers and horticulturalists that survive almost as isolated into modernity in the American Northwest, from Oregon to Alaska, in Amazonia, and in Highland New, New Guinea. In all, in all of these areas, the natives fought, fought ferociously among themselves. Even the Kalahari Bushmen, who were the focus of study in the 1960s and were celebrated as peaceful, in the end turned out to have, to have had four times the 1990 US homicide rate, which is in itself by far the highest in the developed world. <laughs> it has gone down since, I mean, in the United States. They thinly dispersed, yeah. The thinly dispersed Inuit of central ca Canada had 10 times the 1990 US homicide rate. Let me briefly summarize the finds with respect to the many pre-agricultural and pre-state societies studied around the globe, finds which might be vague in any particular case, but which consistently repeat themselves in one separate anthropological case study after the other, thereby becoming an unmistakable pattern. About 25% of adult males in such society found a violent death, while all the rest were covered with, with scars. Contrary to prevailing views, this is a much higher violent death rate than that incurred in modern societies with only the world wars coming close. These are the finds, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with it, uh, that Steven Pinker has recently drawn, to which uh, Steven Pinker has recently drawn wide public attention. Hobbes was much closer to the truth than Rousseau in describing this human state of nature. I shall now pass on very briefly to the question of why people fight. People like all organisms fight for the attainment or defense of the very same object of desire that underlie their lives only by violent means. They can cooperate, compete, or use violence depending on what they believe can serve them best. Violence is not a primary drive which requires release like the desire for food or sex. Think about the Swedes or the Swiss who have not fought for centuries and yet exhibit no particular distress on that account. <laughs> but try to deprive them of food or sex for any substantial period and see what will happen. <laughs> Thus, if violence is hardwired in us, so to speak, it is not as, as it is not a primary drive, but as a means, a tactics for achieving desired aims. And it is a very dangerous means, which is therefore mostly activated if other, most, more peaceful means fail or are too costly, and if the chances of success are judged good. Violence is the hammer in our evolution-shaped behavioral toolkit, which also contains a variety of more delicate instruments to be selected according to the circumstances at hand. So what did people in the state of nature uh, fight about? Resources, 
such as hunting territories, were fiercely competed and fought over because scarcity often meant the difference between life and death. The stakes were very high. Women, surprise again, were hotly fought over again because reproduction is a tremendous selection force and is therefore central to our system of motivation. Polygamy for the most, succe most successful men was the rule, as was fighting caused by, human, uh, by women abduction, rape, and extramarital relations. Ancient sagas, like the Iliad, still testi testify eloquently to the prevalence and significance of this motivation for fighting, which is, which we, with which we are, of course, familiar from anthropological studies. Status in society has always been a means for getting one's way and reaping benefits and has, been, and has been hotly pursued and fought over as such. People staunchly defend their honor, for if they do not, they may be trampled over and encounter further encroachments. That is, create a process of victimization. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, those who prefer shame to war may beget shame and then war. People retaliate to deter injuries inflicted by others because as a famous computer game has demonstrated, tit for tat is the most effective mechanism in human relations. We spend, uh, respond with goodwill to acts of goodwill but pay back on injuries. However, tit for tat often results in a vicious circle of retribution. When people find themselves locked into conflict, irrespective of the original reasons that generated that, that conflict in the first place. We are so familiar with uh, such situation. I mean, the uh, original reason and then they kind of perpetuate themselves. Indeed, under conditions of competition and potential conflict, the other's very existence constitutes a threat, which requires vigilance, increase in, in strength, and even preemption all of which in turn only intensify the sense of mutual insecurity. The result is yet more vicious circles. Arms races, for example, exist all over nature. They are the reason why trees have trunks. They take the enormous expenditure involved in growing trunks only in order to outdo one another in getting to the sun. But arms races often result in what is known as a Red Queen effect, called after one of the paradoxes in Alice's through the, the mirror glass, where the sides run as fast as they can, spending energy and resources only to remain in the same place relative to one another. So there are really enough reasons for conflict and war, which however may get inflated because of the mutual hostility, fear and suspicion that exist among, among antagonists, with conflict seemingly assuming a life of its own, escalating, escalating and perpetrating, uh, per perpetuating itself, causing heavy losses to all sides, almost irrespective of their original motives. Finally, people prefer kin to non-kin, which is the root cause of ethnocentrism and nationalism, and may support kin even by force. Also, they have cultures and comprehensive outlooks, religious and secular ideologies, which they regard to be of crucial importance for altering life in this world and sometimes the, the afterlife, and which again, they may defend and promote by force. Of course, I cannot do justice here to this complex subject. Okay, we now move from prehistory to the present and future. That's a huge jump. <laughs> yeah. Most people are surprised to learn that the occurrence of war and overall mortality rate in war sharply decreased after 1815, especially in the developed world. The so-called long peace among the great powers after 1945 is more recognized and is widely attributed to the nuclear factor, a decisive factor to be sure, which concentrated the minds of all the antagonists wonderfully, as they say about the hanging rope. The inter-democratic peace has been equally recognized, that is, that there is no war between democracies. 
However, the decrease in war had been very marked even before the nuclear era and has encompassed non-democracies as well as democracies. In the century after 1815, wars in more industrializing countries declined in the frequency to about a third, third of what they had been in, in the previous century, an unprecedented change. In fact, the long peace after 1945, 70 years today, was preceded by the second longest peace among the modern great powers between 1871 and 1914. This is 43 years in all. And by the third longest peace between 1815 and 1854, that is 39 years. Thus, the three longest period of peace by far in the modern great power system have all occurred after 1815 with the first two taking place before the nuclear <coughs> era. This striking phenomenon cannot be accidental. Clearly one needs to explain the entire period of reduced belligerency since 1815 while also accounting for the glaring divergence from this trend, the two world war, one divergence. There is a tendency to assume, I, that, that would be the most intuitive uh, answer that most people would give, there is a tendency to assume that wars have declined in frequency, in frequency during the past two centuries because they have become too lethal, destructive, and expensive. This hypothesis barely holds, however, because relative to population and wealth, war have not become more lethal and costly than earlier in history. The wars of the 19th century, the most peaceful century in European history, were in fact particularly light in comparative terms. True, the world wars, especially World War II, were certainly on the upper scale of the range in, term of, in terms of casualties, yet contrary to widespread assumption, they were far from being exceptional in history. We need to look at relative casualties general mortality rate in wars rather than at the aggregate created by the fact that many states participated in the world wars. I'll give a few examples. In the first three years of the Second Punic War, that is Rome's war against Carthage, against, against Hannibal, the first uh, three years is 218 to 216 BC, Rome lost some 50,000 male citizens of the ages of, four, of 17 to 46 out of a total of about 200,000 in these ages. This was roughly 25% of the military age cohorts in only three years. The same range as the Russian military casualties and higher than the German raids in World War II. Similarly, in the 13th century, the Mongol conquest inflicted on the societies of China and Russia casualties and destructions, the, the destruction that are among the highest ever suffered during historical times. Even by the lowest estimates, casualties were at least as high as, and in China almost definitely far higher than the Soviet Union, horrific rate in World War II of about 15% of its population. Final example, during the Thirty Years' War in Europe, 1618 to 1648, population loss in Germany is estimated at between a fifth and a third, either way higher than the German casualties in the First and Second World Wars combined. People often assume that more developed military technology during modernity must mean greater lethality and destructiveness. But in fact, it also means greater protective power, as with mechanized armor, mechanized speed and agility, and defensive electronic measures. Offensive and defensive advances generally rise in tandem and tend to offset each other. In addition, it is all too often forgotten that the vast majority of the many millions of non-combatants killed by Germany during World War II, Jews, Soviet prisoners of war, Soviet civilians, fell victim to intentional starvation, 
exposure to the elements and mass executions rather than to any sophisticated military technology. Instances of genocide in general during the 20th century, much as earlier in history, uh, were carried out with the simplest of technology as the Rwanda genocide horrifically reminded us. Nor is it true that wars during the past two centuries have become economically more costly than they were earlier in history, again relative to overall wealth. War always involved a massive economic exertion and was the single most expensive item of state spending. Both 16th and 17th century Spain and 18th century France, for example, were economically ruined by war and staggering war debts, which in the French case brought about the revolution. Furthermore, death by starvation and pre-modern war, wars was widespread. We said, that, we said before that in pursuit of their aims, people may resort to cooperation, peaceful competition, or violent conflict. Each of these behavioral strategies is a well-designed tool interchangeably employed, employed depending on the particular circumstances and prospects of success. Thus, to understand the gravitation of human choices and norms from violent conflict toward the non-violent option of cooperation and peaceful competition, one needs to understand the changing circumstances and calculus of cost effectiveness during the past two centuries and in recent decades. Even before the middle of the 19th century, uh, thinkers such as Saint-Simon, uh, Auguste Comte, and John Stuart Mill were quick to note the change. They uh, passing decades without war after 1815 immediately struck them as unusual given the uh, Europe's record in the 18th century and earlier, and realized that it was caused by the advent of the Industrial Commercial Revolution, the most profound transformation of human society since the Neolithic adoption of agriculture. In the first place, given explosive growth in per capita wealth, about 30 to 40 fold for, from, the, out, uh, from the, outset, the onset of the revolution to the present, the Malthusian trap has been broken. Wealth no longer constitutes a fundamentally finite quantity, with the only question is how it is divided, so wealth acquisition progressively shifted away from a zero-sum game. Secondly, economies are no longer overwhelmingly autarkic, having become increasingly interconnected by specialization, scale, and exchange. Consequently, foreign devastation potentially depresses the entire system and is thus detrimental to a state's own well-being. Uh, John Stuart Mill said it as early as uh, 1840, 41, that uh, up until now a patriot only had to care about his own country. The rest of the world could go to hell. It didn't affect his own country. From now on, we are interdependent. So if the others are ruined, so they are our customers, they, are, they sell things to us, we are now, we must uh, pay attention to what happens in other uh, to other countries. And, and what Mill discerned in the abstract in the uh, 1840s was repeated by Norman Engel during the first global age before World War I and for, from the cornerstone of John Maynard Keynes' criticism of the harsh reparations imposed on Germany after World War I. Thirdly, great economic openness has decreased the likelihood of war by disassociating economic excess from the, con from the confines of political borders and sovereignty. It is no longer necess necessary to politically possess a territory in order to benefit from it. Thus, the greater yield of, of competitive economic cooperation, the greater the yield of competitive economic cooperation, the more counterproductive and less attractive conflict becomes. Rather than war becoming more costly, as, it, as is widely believed, it is in fact peace that has, uh, that has been growing more profitable. 
If so, why have wars continued to occur during the past two centuries, albeit at a much lower frequency? In the first place, ethnic and nationalist tensions often overrode the logic of the new economic realities, accounting for most wars in Europe between 1815 and 1945. They continue to do so today, especially in the less developed parts of the globe. Moreover, the logic of the new economic realities receded during the, the late 19th century and early 20th century as the great power resumed protectionist policies and expanded them to the undeveloped parts of the world with the new imperialism. I hope, I hope you know what I'm talking about, uh, okay, the, the return of imperialism from the 1880s and the return of, uh, of uh, tariffs um, against against the imports between among the uh, between the great between the powers uh, all these uh, were developments that uh, took place from the late 19th century. This development signaled that the emerging global economy might become partitioned rather than open, with each imperial domain becoming close to everybody else, as indeed they eventually did in the 1930s. Even Britain who was the champion of uh, free trade during the 19th century, uh, from 1932 on became, adopted the policy, retreated from free trade, adopted the policy known as imperial preference, that is there were tariff wars around Britain and the empire uh, to prevent others from uh, exporting to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the territories of the uh, British uh, empire. A snowball effect ensued generating a runaway grab for imperial territories. For the territorially confined Germany and Japan, the need to break away, to break away into an imperial Lebensraum for the Germans, or co-prosperity sphere, as the Japanese called it, seemed particularly pressing. We are often horrified by, say, take, let's say the Japanese conduct in the, uh, in the 1930s, but they said, you say that it's no longer legitimate to, to acquire empires, and yet you yourself uh, keep, uh, keep your empires, and what is more, you close them now to our exports. Until 1932, it was possible for the Japanese to export into, the, into say, the, the realm of the British Empire. Now it's closed, so if so, we also need uh, what they called an uh, East Asian co-prosperity sphere. Here lay the seeds of the two world wars. Furthermore, the retreat from economic liberalism in the first decades of the 20th century sparked and was sparked by the rise of the power of anti-liberal and anti-democratic political ideologies and regimes incorporating a creed of violence, communism, and fascism. Since 1945, the decline of major war has deepened further. Nuclear weapons have been a crucial factor in this process, but no less significant has been the institutionalization of free trade and the closely related process of rapid and sustained economic growth. The spread of liberal democracy has been equally potent. Indeed, although non-liberal and non-democratic states also became much less belligerent, belligerent during the industrial age, it is the liberal democracies that have been the most attuned to its pacifying aspect. Relying on arbitrary coercive force at home, non-democratic countries have found it more natural to use force abroad. By contrast, liberal democratic societies are socialized to peaceful, law-mediated relations at home, and the citizens have grown to expect that the same norm be applied internationally. Living in increasingly tolerant societies, they have grown more receptive of the other's point of view, promoting freedom, legal equality, and political participation domestically, Liberal democratic powers, though initially in possession of vast empires, have found it increasingly di difficult to justify ruling over foreign peoples without their consent. And, and sanctifying life, liberty, and human rights, they have proven to be failures 
in forceful repression. Furthermore, with the individual's life and pursuit of happiness elevated above group values, sacrifice of life in war has increasingly lost legitimacy in liberal democratic countries. War remains, retains legitimacy only under narrow and narrowing formal and practical conditions and is generally viewed as extremely abhorrent and undesirable. Thus, modernization, most notably in its liberal path, has sharply reduced the prevalence of war as the violent option for fulfilling human desires have become much less rewarding than the peaceful option of competitive cooperation. For instance, with the much increased se uh, sexual opportunity within society, young men now are more reluctant to leave behind the pleasures of life for the rigors and chastity of the field. Make love, not war, was the slogan of the powerful anti-war youth campaign of the 1960s, which not accidentally coincided with the far-reaching liberalization of sexual norms. Mm -hmm. the, fru the fruits of the, all these deepening trends and sensibilities have been nothing short of miraculous. The probability of war between affluent democracies has declined to a vanishing point, where they no longer even see the need to prepare for the possibility of a militarized dis dispute with one another. Im imagine that, that Holland and Belgium no longer fear either the uh, uh, German invasion or a French invasion. That all it seems almost um, impossible in view of. Um, in view of uh, historical experience. Both geographical center of gravity of nothing defends Canada from the United States. What is it that defends Canada from the United States? Again, and uh, the Canadians uh, complain about the neighbors, but they do not fear an American takeover. Um, I mean, military takeover. Uh, both, yeah, both geographical center of gravity has shifted radically. The economically developed parts of the world have become a zone of peace. War now appears to be confined to the less developed parts of the globe, the world zone of war, where countries that have lagged behind in modernization and its pacifying spin-off effects occasionally still fight among themselves as well as with developed countries. At this happy junction, it's time to turn our attention to some major countervailing forces and stress that the dramatic spread of peace is far from being foolproof and free from shadows and challenges. Perhaps the most significant challenge is the return of capitalist, non-democratic great powers, a regime type that has been absent from the international system since the defeat of Germany and Japan in 1945. The massive growth of formerly communist and fast industrializing authoritarian capitalist China represents the greatest change in the global balance of power. Russia too has retreated from its post-communist communist liberalism and has assumed an increasingly authoritarian and nationalistic character coupled with a more aggressive stance along its borders. Its occupation of the Crimea and military involvement in the Ukraine, and now in Syria also, are the cause of a deep, of a deep conflict with the West and again raises the possibility of major war in Europe, already believed to, have been, to be a thing of the past. Will China and Russia eventually democratize with development is perhaps the most crucial question of the 21st century. The lessons of history are not clear about the ine inevitability of the process as some progressivists tend to believe. Furthermore, since the outbreak of the economic crisis in 2008, the authoritarian great powers have gained much in confidence while the hegemony and prestige of democratic capitalism have suffered a massive blow unparalleled since the, since the 1930s. And the, then the rise, and, and the rise then of uh, fascist and communist totalitarianism. One hopes 
that the current economic and political uh, malaise will not be nearly as catastrophic. And yet the global allure of state-driven and nationalistic uh, capitalist authoritarianism may grow substantial. At the same time, American might, the main reason not sufficiently appreciated for the triumph of democracy in the 20th century is undergoing relative decline, though probably not as steep as it is sometimes imagined. Deeply integrated into the world economy, the new capitalist authoritarian powers partake of the development, open trade, capitalist peace, but not of the liberal democratic one. The democratic and non-democratic powers may coexist more or less peacefully, armed because of mutual fear and suspicion, but there is also the prospect of more antagonistic relations, accentuated and ideological rivalry, potential and actual conflict, intensified armed races, and new cold wars. The September 11, 2001 mega-terror attacks in the United States have turned attention to yet another sh shadow hanging over the decline of belligerency, and this is unconventional terror employing weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Of these biological weapons have the greatest potential as the revolutionary breakthroughs in the decipherment of the genome and in biotechnology open up new horizons in terms of lethality and accessibility. A virulent labor laboratory cultivated strain of bacteria or virus, let alone a specially engineered superbug against which no immunization exists, might bring the lethality of biological weapons within the range of nuclear attack while while well being far more easily accessible to terrorists than nuclear weapons. Fortunately, in contrast to chemical and biological agents, terrorists cannot produce nuclear weapons, yet they might obtain them from those who can. At the root of the problem is the trickling down to below the state level of the technologies and materials of mass killing. The greatest threat of nuclear prolifer proliferation into countries with low security standards and high levels of corruption is the far increased danger of leakage. Furthermore, states in the less developed and unstable parts of the world are ever in danger of disintegrating and of disintegration and anarchy. When state authority collapses and anarchy takes hold, as in Syria today, who is to guarantee the country's nuclear arsenal? Obviously, Syria doesn't have nuclear weapons, but what about Pakistan with its past sales of nuclear know-how and potential instability? Um, this is a, a much discussed uh, case. Indeed, failed states like the collapsed Soviet Union during the 1990s, rather than the former nuclear superpower, may be the, may be the model of future threats. The new caliphate of Iraq and Syria which is, with its virulent anti-modernist ideology and hideous practices is another recent example. Scenarios of world-threatening individual and organizations previously reserved to fiction of the James Bond genre suddenly become real. Because deterrence based on mutual assured destruction scarcely applies to, to terrorists, the use of, the, of ultimate weapons is more likely to come from them than it is from states. Unconventional capability acquired by terrorists is usable. Indeed, one, uh, once the potential exists, it, 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 it is difficult to see what will stop, him, what will stop it from materializing somewhere, sometime. Sorry uh, for spoiling your appetite. Mm -hmm. Apologize. This is a baffling prob problem which does not lend itself to easy or clear solutions. Defensive measures are almost as problematic as the preemptive, especially in the democracies, because of their infringement on civil rights. Regarding both the offensive and defensive elements of the war on terror, uh, the debate in the democracies assumes a bitterly ideological and righteous character, and yet the threat of unconventional terrorism is real, is here to stay, and it, uh, it offers no easy solutions. 
We are clearly experiencing the most peaceful times in history by far, a strikingly blissful and deeply grounded tre trend. Yet it is also true that this is also the most dangerous world ever, world ever, with people for the first time possessing the ability to destroy themselves completely, and even individuals and small groups gaining the ability to cause mass death. Proverbially, predictions are just as fine as long as they are not applied to the future. Past trends may change direction or, inter or interact differently over time, and we can only hope that despite ups and downs, the general trends will endure. Thank you. <laughs>